Just making a little video about the tractor. Oh yeah. Yeah. How are you? Good. Run Robert. Steve's son. Oh yeah. This tractor's been an interesting journey. It has, eh? A lot of things to fix on it, but it's running pretty good when it runs. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're old, but they work good, eh? Oh yeah, they do. Yeah. 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 yeah Those look sturdy. Oh yeah. Yeah, they're uh, rated at 14,000 pounds. Wow. Yeah, they carry lots. Happy to get your tractor back? I am, I am. I, I'm sorry to see it have to go in the first place again, but that other tire let loose. And I just want to explain something that I've noticed over the years, and you might find it useful. And it has to do with the uh, the relative value of, of used and new machinery. This is a 60 horsepower tractor. It's got an eight foot wide blower on it. There's a loader on the front with a hydraulic grapple hook. Um, it's not a pretty tractor, but it costs exactly the same amount of money as that snow blower. I got both of these machines for $3,500 each. My point is how much more value you can get with used if you're willing to put up with lower reliability and a greater need to start turning wrenches or getting help with things. I, I love that snowblower. It's a great snowblower and it's perfect for walkways and things around the house. Close quarters work. But in, just in terms of raw horsepower, there's of course no comparison. And a tractor like this does a lot more than just blow snow too. It did take some, some tender loving care to get it to this point. And, you know, I'd say maybe once every couple of months or every three or four months or certainly every six months, something goes wrong on this thing and I have to do a little bit a bit of fixing but when you actually figure out how long it takes you to fix things and the cost of parts and things like that it still works out really well a tractor like this <clears throat> even a good used one could easily be fifty thousand dollars and I just you know I don't have that kind of money to spend on a tractor that I don't really use all the time so that's the philosophy this blower is kind of interesting though. this was growing moss in a forest somewhere and there were lots of things on it that didn't work. Uh, the chute was kind of rusted in place so it, it couldn't swivel. I freed that up and then I installed this hydraulic cylinder here so I can control the direction of the chute from the seat. This chain broke, drive chain, broke shortly after I started using it. Whenever you use a machine heavily, like blowing snow, the, the weakest links are going to break and it, and it takes you a little while to shake things down. This bearing went bad shortly after I started using it. The first year. I've never had any trouble with the blower after that first year, after we got through all the shaking down process. This business about buying used and you know, learning how to maintain it and how to fix it, uh, it's actually a very economical way to do it when you can afford to. For many people living in the country where you don't necessarily need your equipment all the time, this is, uh, this is a, a very good option. And, uh, you know, despite the bumps along the way, I think it makes sense. This was, tractor was new in 1977. It's a Hydro 84, which means it doesn't have a clutch uh, like a regular tractor. I kind of wish it did. I prefer the, stand, uh, the con conventional, traditional transmissions, but it's a kind of hydrostatic drive. One of the things I added to this was a set of tire chains. This is just a two-wheel drive tractor, and without these chains, it was completely useless in the snow. It, it, it couldn't even push the blower into snow very effectively on any kind of a rise. The tires are filled with calcium chloride solution. You know, they're very heavy, it's a weighted tire, but the chains have made all the difference. The thing about a chain, a tire chain is that it has to be kind of loose in order to go on because there's, there's slack in different places as you put it on, but in order to be effective for use, it has to be fairly tight. This is what this wire is all about. Um, I can do up the tire chains and they would work okay, but they'd be pretty floppy. This wire arrangement here solves that problem quite nicely. This is a, an electric fence tensioner. 
it's it's made to tighten up high tensile electric fence wire but it actually works well for tightening any kind of wire so here's here's some fence wire it's not as heavy as it comes it's kind of a medium size wire um, but slipped through the links in between every space all around and then tightened up here makes for a, a really nice installation it's as, it's as tight as it can be and it's simple to do and it's easy to remove and uh, it just works really well when i bought this tractor from a friend of mine uh, he delivered it on a float and and it was running um, working kind of okay there were a few things i had to fix the first thing i did was to fix this muffler uh, the tractor came from the factory with a with a, an exhaust pipe and muffler that stuck up straight but it was purchased by a farmer uh, who had some low barns that he wanted to get into so he he changed the exhaust manifold and now we have this underslung muffler which is fine i like it uh, it gets the exhaust out of your face better than the other one would but it was just flopping around in fact um the exhaust actually the exhaust pipe actually stopped here so uh, this section of pipe wasn't there uh, but luckily enough I, I found a piece of pipe at an auto supply place and it just jammed into the muffler perfectly it was a nice tight fit in there so i stuck it in and i brazed around the outside and that's worked perfectly everything else is quite sound and solid let me see if i can get in and see that braze there in just a second so there's the muffler and you stuck it in there oh, and there's where you braze so there was a hole in there and you just stuck there was it a in. hole where some other kind of pipe went in i don't think it went all the way back as far as this one i think it might have ended sooner i don't know i never saw it now the, the muffler didn't didn't have much supporting it either so i find that chains do a great job of holding any kind of an exhaust system. I do this on my truck all the time. Instead of a solid mount, uh, the, the chain option gives it a little bit of flex and movement, which helps it to last longer. You see, so you threaded a bolt through there, uh, through that um, metal piece and hung the chain from that. Right, and I have the same thing going on at the back end because that exhaust pipe's now quite long and it goes all the way out to the back. Oh yeah, so there's the other chain. Yeah, it just works, it works really well. Now, there was another problem. <clears throat> You can come down under here. You gonna pay me extra for this? <laughs> uh, the exhaust pipe leading uh, from the engine comes here. Uh, there was a, uh, a a joint here where it, it started to meet this bend bent part, and that was well, it was together, but it wasn't sealed. It was kind of you could kind of move it from side to side, so a lot of exhaust was coming out there. I got this repair uh, band. For a muffler it actually was a little bit too big to grip this pipe properly but the idea is that it's a stainless steel band that goes around the pipe and then you can tighten it up it's used for exhaust repairs the problem was it was a little bit too big so if you see here there's some other metal what i did was i got the next size up of exhaust pipe uh, a short length of it split it in half lengthwise so that I could put one half here and one half here. And I slathered the whole thing with high temperature silicone. It's actually a great muffler cement, I guess you say. It's far better than traditional muffler cement because it, it remains flexible. So slathered the whole thing with the high temperature silicone and then did up this band clamp and a three years of use and it's rock solid. So that's not going anywhere. That saved me a huge amount of hassle that I otherwise would have faced if I had to change this pipe. So sometimes MacGyver type fixes uh, are the way to go uh, if they save you a whole lot of trouble. And once you, you know, once you get involved in old machinery like this and you start taking things apart, I mean, there's no telling what's gonna break, what bolt's gonna be seized up. And minimal intervention for a great repair is what I find works quite well. One of the problems that I ran into with the tractor is that the starter motor out uh, maybe a year after I got it. There are a lot of seat of the pants modifications to this tractor and I think one of them might be down around here to do with this loader. I don't know what's a factory part and what's been um, fabricated on farm but anyway the starter motor is way down here. Okay this is the, uh, the starter drive like the, um, the electromagnetic Bendix starter drive type thing and then the starter motor which is I know it's huge it's down here so it's hard to get at but I needed to take it off 
in order to get it rebuilt. And there are bolts that hold that on. I don't know if you can see them, but there's, there's three bolts. There's one here, and then there's another one over there, and there's another one underneath. I could get a wrench on the other two, but I couldn't get a wrench on this one because there's, there's not enough room to move the wrench. I could get the wrench on it, but I couldn't actually turn it. So I struggled and puzzled for a while, and that's... And I've made a video about this before, but I'll just mention it again. That, that's when I, when I bored a hole through the frame here. Total thickness of that is, uh, it's about three quarters of an inch of solid steel. And I used, believe it or not, a bimetal hole saw. Didn't burn out the drill, and the, the hole saw was pretty well just as sharp as when I started. Now, I did take it easy, and I did use lots of real cutting oil on this. I think I probably would have burned out the hole saw if I had just gone at it dry metal full speed. So I, I did take it easy and I, and I, I lubed it up a lot, but uh, pretty amazing. The plug of steel I removed. There's actually two layers there. There's a, th a thinner layer, which I think is on the outside, and then a thicker layer. But it adds up to more than three quarters of an inch. It took me about 20 minutes to remove that. And this is the hole saw that did the job. Still quite good. I mean, it's the teeth are sharp enough that you can still feel the... They still grab your finger. They're not quite as sharp as new. I think I lost the tip of this tooth. But considering what it cut through, I'm pretty impressed. Last summer when we were cutting wood, my son Joseph was driving this, and all of a sudden the clutch pedal fell, fell to the floor under its own weight. Couldn't drive unless you put your foot under it and lift it up. What happened was this return spring broke. Now this is a new one I've put in here, just from the hardware store. Just a regular small town hardware store had a great selection of, in this case, expansion springs. That solved the problem. So when the tractor wouldn't drive properly, I started my, my research under here, because I knew there were some valve things. This control lever here, a zillion, a zillion inches of slack in it, but when you push it all the way up, it makes the tractor go forward. And then all the way back, it makes it go back, and in between, it's neutral. And there's a certain amount of variability. I mean, if you put it part way through, you can get a, a kind of a lower gear arrangement. One of my complaints with this tractor is that the gearing is not low enough. There are times when I wish for lower gearing. Nothing I can do about that. But anyway, the problem was I would, I would put it all the way forward, and the tractor wouldn't drive. Uh, what's going on? So I, I was looking at these valves here, and I noticed something something that you don't notice now. Um, when I when I move this around, there wasn't just rotation of this piece, there was actual movement of it. So the hole that this that's in this piece that swiveled on this bolt had gotten too big for me. It was just all the years of, of working it back and forth had made this hole too big. And when I put this up, there was enough slop from that oversized hole that I wasn't I wasn't pulling the valve far enough to actually make it actuate properly. I mean, sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. I took this out and I saw that, that the hole was too large in this piece. And there was also some wear on the shank of this bolt. So I took it apart, took this piece off, built up some weld on the inside of the hole, more than I needed, and then I, I re-drilled that hole. Also built up the weld, uh, the metal on the outside of the shank of this bolt and ground it down, and just fooled around with it for a while until I had a, a good swiveling fit, but no extra slop, and that solved the problem. So it's just a perfect example of how <clears throat> sometimes it's just the tiniest little things that you need to fix, and if you uh, think about it for a while, you can save yourself a lot of money. Yes, it takes me time to do this, but not as much time as you'd think. Not as much time as I would lose paying for a, a more expensive, better tractor. Now, would I like a more expensive, better tractor? Yes. I might not want a brand new one, though. As with a lot of things in the world, various forces, mostly bureaucratic and governmental, they're making machinery worse than they used to be. I've talked to a number of guys, mechanics their whole lives. They much prefer, say, uh, you know, a tractor from the 80s or something like that, which doesn't have any electronics on it. It's all mechanical. But there's a certain vintage of John Deere tractor, four-wheel drive, that ultimately one day I'd like to replace this tractor with if I can find one at a good price. For now, I really can't complain. Uh, this old, heavy, old beast does a good job for us. Thanks for joining me again this week. Subscribe, like, 
hit the notifications bell so you know when I have new videos coming out. And join me next week. I've got some woodworking tips for you and a bunch of other interesting things. And sign up for my newsletter. The link's in the description box. Almost 30,000 people get it every week. They love it, and I know you will too.